Good afternoon. Well, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to talk with you all about reimagining leadership for the 21st century. Now, as Bud mentioned, um, my background is as a social scientist, and while I consider myself a pretty, you know, hands-on, in the trenches kind of leader, the social science part of me just can't resist gathering a little extra data <laughs> before I do my presentation. So I want to thank you for indulging me just real quick. I'm going to do an informal data collection gathering survey from you all on exactly this topic. All right. Everyone ready? Okay. By a show of hands, how many people in this room approve of the performance of the top five global superpowers? That is the United States, China, Russia, the EU, and Germany. Okay. <laughs> now, since we're here in the United States today, let's talk about US leadership. By a show of hands, how many people in the room today approve of the work of the US Congress? And I don't mean your particular representative or this party or that party. I mean Congress as a whole. How many people think that Congress is doing a good job? OK. <laughs> Let's get real local now. How many people in this room, again, by a show of hands, have ever experienced working with a terrible leader? Maybe it was a boss or a team lead, an instructor of some sort, someone who's either incompetent or just really difficult to work with. <laughs> OK. Well, this is excellent. I mean, terrifying in terms of what your responses actually say about this problem and how leadership is doing right now in the modern world. But I can assure you, from a data reliability perspective, the responses that I'm seeing here today from you all pretty much mirror what we social scientists have found. So let's take a look at the actual data on these questions. 22 to 45%. This is the range of approval ratings right now for the top five global superpowers, right? So on the low end, we have 22%. On the high end, 45%. And it's not really important who falls where. You can probably make some guesses there. But the important thing to recognize here is that there is no single country that is able to garner even a majority of the world's approval. And on the low end, we have some countries barely getting one in five. So not good for leadership on the global level. Let's take a look at some other data. 15 to 20%. This is actually right now, for 2015, the range of approval ratings for the US Congress. And these are actually fairly high. <laughs> My background's in political science, believe me, they dip lower than this. But the point here is that actually, at best, one in five of you approves of the job that Congress is doing right now. So I want you to take a moment and imagine that you're one of those five people. You think Congress is doing you know, at least an okay job, they get your approval. And now, I want you to look to your left. And the two people to your left likely disagree with you. And now I want you to look to your right. And the two people to your right likely disagree with you as well. The point is, you can pretty much drop yourself down anywhere in this country, and if you think that Congress isn't doing a great job, you're gonna have a good conversation starter, because there's gonna be a lot of people who agree with you. Okay, final piece of data on this. 75%. Recent data suggests that 75% of workers in the US believe that their boss is the most difficult and stressful part of their job. But wait, <laughs> it gets better. Fully 23 to 45% of people believe that they work for an unethical or abusive boss. So for them, not only is their boss you know, an unpleasant source of stress that they have to deal with regularly, but they actually believe that she or he is a bad person. And in some cases, they're right. So what is my point here? Why am I showing you all this data? Why did we do this sort of informal survey? My point is, it doesn't take a social scientist to see that we have a leadership problem, right? And it exists at all levels and across multiple sectors. OK, so with that established, I think we can all agree, leadership problem. So what, right? How does this affect you? How does this affect me? Why should we care? Well. I think there's a couple of things to think about here. First of all, whether we like it or not, leadership matters. The people who make decisions at the top affect our lives in ways big and small. Everything from how well the economy is doing to you know, the education system, to equality in America, to you know, even the micro level, how much you enjoy your job, how much money you're able to make, how far you're able to advance. Now maybe some of you hear me saying this today and you think, well that's great, those things do seem serious, but they don't really affect me directly. And if they don't affect you yet, I'd say, just wait, because they will. 
And if you truly, truly believe that you know, none of this is gonna affect you, it doesn't now, it seems like a problem, but like not really relevant to my life, then I encourage you to consider yourself as being in a place of privilege because it is rare to not be affected by these things. And it's okay to have that privilege, but if you have it, you need to recognize it and think about whether there's a responsibility to your fellow human beings. Because there are a lot of people who will wake up every day for the rest of their lives and have to deal with the problems of bad leadership and who have no choice but to do so. The second thing I think it's important to think about when we look at these numbers is that, you know, it's easy to look at them and think, well, we could have a whole conversation today, right, about how bad leadership is. But that's actually not my intention. I think we need to look at these numbers and just remember that they are not set in stone. There is no one saying that these numbers have to look this way. Sure, maybe any one of us as an individual might have trouble kind of tackling these and chipping away at them. Not that that's impossible. But if we band together and decide that there is a better way and commit to change, we can definitely cause a movement in the right direction. And some of you might think, well, that sounds great, but you know, a little overly idealistic, maybe even a little naive. But if history shows us anything, it's, some of the most, it's that some of the most important and lasting change we've seen in our world started with just a group of people saying, hey, the status quo isn't okay, we can do better, and we need to create change. And luckily enough, we just happen to be alive at a time when an increasing number of people are looking at these numbers and they are recognizing that they're not okay. This isn't acceptable and we can do better. And more than that, they are daring to imagine and bring to life a new and better way of living and leading. And these are the people who I call the new alphas, right? In contrast to that traditional alpha model of leadership. And for the remainder of my time today, I'm gonna to talk with you a little bit about who these folks are, how they're different, and how they're able to pull it off. And before I get started in that, though, I wanna recognize that what I'm gonna to say today may sound familiar to some of you all, because I'm willing to bet that some of you are already living and leading like this. And if so, I wanna say thank you, because we need you. We need people like you who are daring to lead differently. And I also wanna say, again, this might sound familiar, but I hope that it is empowering and affirming and if you're new to leadership, or your leadership path, or maybe you're a veteran leader who just recognizes that there's a better way to do this, then I hope that what I'm about to say gives you some optimism and some inspiration. All right, so let's get started. Who are these new alpha characters? Well, I think the easiest way to think about it, actually, is to start with the traditional alpha model. And in the traditional alpha model, the main aim is achievement, right? We want leaders who can you know, identify the vision, the big goal, and get folks there, influence and motivate them toward it. And that's great. We don't want that to go away. That is, in fact, an essential skill for leaders to have. The problem is that when that's the only aim, a lot of other important factors that relate to leading really effectively, and honestly, just being a good and decent human being, kind of go out the window. And so I think we can all imagine, from our own lives, we have experience with this, but imagine that leader who's really high performing, right? Just total superstar, high achieving, but you know, has some other issues. Either they're unethical, or unfair, or completely oblivious to their own health and well-being, or that of the people they work with, and in some cases, just plain unpleasant, right? So clearly, this model has some deficiencies. And that's where the new alpha model comes in. Let's take a look. The new alphas have three aims. You can see achievement is still on there. We don't want to lose that. That's good. But there's also this idea of fulfillment. And that means we're focusing on long-term well-being and happiness. And we know this is important from psychology research, and I'll get a little bit into that um, later in the talk. But also, this idea of impact. And impact is different from achievement, because whereas achievement is about you know, accomplishing tasks, getting them done, Impact is about making sure that what you do in this world goes beyond just yourself, that you're making a positive difference in the lives of others or somehow bettering the world. All right, so usually at this point, people say, well, that sounds really great. <laughs> yes, I do like achievement, but even better, I would like achievement and fulfillment and impact. So how do they pull it off? And the answer is that it's complex, right? No one single human being looks just like another. There's no magic formula. but. In studying and working with the new alphas, I have found that there are three big ideas that underlie their philosophy. And that's what I'm gonna share with you now. So big idea number one 
is a commitment to personal excellence. The new alphas believe that strong leadership starts by looking inward and working to be the best human beings that we can be. So this means not necessarily being better than that person or that person, but the best version of ourselves. And so this means that they take care of their physical and mental health, right? Because that takes time in the short run, but they recognize that in the long run, it's gonna give them the energy and stamina to reach really big and go after significant change in the world. More than that, the new alphas are great at building positive relationships with others. And this goes back to that aim of fulfillment. We know that having positive relationships actually correlates with long-term fulfillment. There's good psychology research that shows that. But just think about it on a practical level, right? If you wanna do anything in this world that's bigger than yourself, you're gonna need some help. And people are more likely to wanna help you and get on board with what you're doing if they like you and can relate to you and feel good about the work that you're doing. So positive relationships are key. And then the final piece of this commitment to personal excellence, and this to me is a huge differentiator when I think about the new alphas compared to the traditional alphas. The new alphas value character and ethics. In fact, they value them as much as they value achievement. So things like kindness and compassion, those matter. Courage, especially in the face of difficult situations, matters. Humility is key. Being an active and engaged citizen in this world. Now, are the new alphas perfect? No, none of us are. But the idea behind this big idea is that they are continuously improving. And not just like, let's do better tomorrow, you know, compared to today or next month. Continuous improvement is a part of their life. They will do it for years and years and years to come. It's not something that they stop. So that's big idea number one, a commitment to personal excellence. Let's look at big idea number two in the new alpha philosophy. And that is an understanding of self and purpose. The new alphas wanna know who they are as human beings, and they focus on figuring out what their strengths are, their skills, their values, their passions, their interests, how they do their best work. And they're great also about seeking out critical feedback. And this, again, I think is what differentiates them from the traditional alpha models. When you imagine the traditional high achiever, you know, they don't want people to know that they're not perfect or that they have chinks in their armor. New alphas, nope, <laughs> perfectionism is out the window. They really wanna work to figure out what their blind spots are and what their weaknesses are so that they can work to do better. And more importantly, when you have that, that data, that understanding of yourself and feedback from others, you can figure out what your purpose is, your mission, your reason for being in this world. And again, this is important for a couple of reasons. First, we know that having a sense of purpose, according to the research, correlates with that second new alpha aim, right, of fulfillment. But also just think about it. No matter who you are in this world, right, even if you love what you do day in and day out, there are gonna be days when you wake up and do not wanna do whatever it is you have to do on that day. We've all had them. But if you have a sense of purpose and you believe that what you're doing is actually gonna go beyond just yourself, then you're more likely to have the energy and the motivation to get through them to get where you need to be. All right, so two of the three big ideas in the new alpha philosophy down. One, a commitment to personal excellence. Two, an understanding of self and purpose. Three, I think, is deceptively simple. Three is that the new alphas have the ability to make things happen. And again, I think you think about this and you think, yeah, that's great, of course. You know, you figure out what it is you wanna do and you go and do it. But for anyone who's actually ever taken on something pretty big, this is a lot easier said than done. And I think because this is the one that I actually personally struggle with the most, I wanna share with you a story about an experience that I had in trying to make something happen that I think underscores both why it's so important, but also why it can be so difficult. So I want you to imagine me early in my career. I was a new teacher. I taught special education kindergarten. And I remember we had this math curriculum that we had to use with our kindergarten students. And it was you know, mandated from the district. And it was awful. <laughs> it was just not good. It was very difficult to teach. And the students didn't really get much from it. And I saw that they weren't making progress. And I remember feeling so frustrated about this because I thought, you know, there are some changes we could make to this, but it was mandated. I was like a new teacher, <laughs> didn't have tenure, didn't want to break the rules. But I thought, you know, and, and some changes I think we needed to make that were a lot larger. Um, but I felt like I am certainly not a math instruction expert. Don't get me wrong. You know by now that I love data. I love crunching numbers on my own. But that is very different than figuring out how math works in a you know, five-year-old child's head. So I thought we need to get some help, an instructional coach, maybe the person from the district who you know, mandated this. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna step up and find this person. 
So I went around and I looked and people were, you know, understandably busy or unavailable or doing other things. But meanwhile, I was watching and students just weren't learning. It was not a good curriculum. And so finally, in desperation, I went to my principal and I said, look, we have a problem here. This curriculum doesn't work. We need someone to help us, you know, kind of tear it apart, redo it, make it work for the students. And I remember, I'll never forget what she said. And she was, by the way, totally rockin' leader, total new alpha. She said, Danielle, I understand what you're saying. But the reality is we don't have any resources to put toward this. And I was like, okay. And she's like, but I trust your judgment. I believe you if you say it's not working. So go ahead and make the changes you think need to be made. And I was like, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. I, I, don't, I can't make the changes. I mean, I'm happy to do the work, but I am not an expert in math instruction. She goes, no, no, no. You have two options. Either you make the changes or you keep it as it is. So I thought about it. I went back to my classroom. And I thought, well, you know, there are some obvious things I can do. Let's just start small, right? So I made a few changes, and they went pretty well. So I thought, well, I'll do some bigger changes. And they went pretty well. And I thought, I'll make some really big changes. And it went a lot better. And don't get me wrong, along the way, I made some changes that did not work. And those I quickly dropped. But then I thought, well, math is going really well. Math achievement was like through the roof. I thought, well, the writing curriculum isn't very good either. Why don't I make some tweaks over there? So I did. And writing went a lot better. And then I thought, well, you know what? Reading, we could make some improvements. It's OK, but it could be better. So I made some tweaks there. And before I knew it, I had veteran teachers from all around the district coming in to watch me teach. And I don't say this to brag or because I felt proud. I felt like a total fraud. I was like waiting for one of them to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is not how you teach. But it was totally the opposite. They were jazzed about what I was doing, and they wanted to help. And so I ended up working with a lot of them. And again, student achievement just kept going up and up until by the end of the year, 100% of my special education students had completed every single one of their individual education goals. You have individual goals in special ed. But more than that, fully 30% of my students finished above grade level. They were actually performing better than the general education kindergarten students in the class next door. And so why am I telling you this story? I mean, it seems so obvious now. But my point is that if you are waiting for someone to come along, someone with more experience, you know, with better credentials or just more know-how than you, to fix that problem that you see or make that change that you think needs to be changed or to give you permission to do that, you may very well be waiting forever because there are simply too many important and urgent problems in this world for us to wait for the experts to solve them all. And if there is any single most important lesson that I've learned from studying and working with the new alphas, it's that there is a new and better way to live and lead, and change is definitely possible. But change begins now, and it begins with us. Thank you.